Good morning and uh, welcome to worship this morning. It's good to see you all uh, here. Um, welcome to, special welcome to any guests we might have. Also, uh, to those who may be watching from home or from wherever you're at on Facebook or on the internet. Uh, however you've joined us today, and we're glad. For those of you that are in the room here, we'd like you to fill out those yellow cards uh, and uh, Drop those in in the pews there, that, uh, and then drop those in the offering plate when that comes by a little bit later in the service. A um, few things to call to your attention: Fall Fest is today. I mean, here's the day, uh, four to seven. Uh, you can see the tables and chairs are ready to move into the courtyard. They're going to put out some tents, and that's where the chili cook-off is going to be, and car show, and trunk or treat, and uh, just lots of. Good stuff happening today from 4 to 7. So I hope that some of you uh, or many of you are able to uh, come back for that. Uh, also, uh, today is the beginning of uh, launch of our stewardship campaign um, with our uh, theme, Live Simply. You may remember that last year our theme was Live Generously. Okay. Uh, and today we're, and this year we're following the theme, Live Simply. Uh, we're going to have some bulletin inserts, and you have the, the one for, the, um, uh, for our first Sunday here. If you want to take that, I just want to point out a few things about that. Um, uh, the first theme is follow Jesus, and our text is from Matthew 6. Of course, that's the Sermon on the Mount, uh, where Jesus reminds us to not to worry because uh, God takes care of, of God's creation, the birds, the flowers, and how much more will God take care of you? So I want to direct your attention to that last paragraph on the insert there where, where uh, we read, Jesus comes to us in the midst of our fears and announces, do not worry. God has provided for all your needs. What does it mean to live, for us to live in relationship with Jesus? How might our daily discipleship help us to live more simply? trusting in God's abundance. Okay, and I think that's a good thought for us to um, begin uh, our campaign on, that, that uh, we trust in God's abundance. God is a God of abundance, not scarcity. <clears throat> um, and we also want to uh, talk a little bit about generosity, you know, during our campaign. And I've encouraged... Um, uh, members to sub support some, uh, I mean, or to submit some generosity stories. And we have received a couple. Uh, the generosity story I just want to share with you uh, briefly this, this morning is in regard to our uh, photograph uh, picture directory program. I know many of you have already taken your, uh, had your pictures taken. We do have a few more um, Openings this afternoon, uh, sign up sheet uh, indicates that. So if you didn't sign up yet, there's still a chance to do that um, over right over here in the table. But uh, you may be aware that uh, Dave Casperson, professional photographer, member of Grace, is doing all of this photography um, with no charge to us. He's going to provide those photos to us with a copyright. Uh, and this is uh, a, a the generosity of his gifts and sharing his photographic uh, gifts with the congregation. So I think that's just a really uh, great uh, generosity story. And, and, and um, all that he expects of us is uh, there's that phrase that we hear sometimes, pay it forward, pay it forward. So uh, that's something you can keep in mind as we move through our campaign and we look towards making our plans for 23, and we're going to do that on November 13th, November 13th, on the fourth week of our campaign. 
we're going to ask everyone to come to the dining room at 9.15, and we'll have just like a half-hour program there. And we'll have a chance to for this group to meet with the 10.30, 10 o'clock people, and maybe some of the Saturday people, too. We hope we'll come to that. A chance for us to gather together, and then we'll receive our cards, uh, our intent cards, and, uh, and then take those home and bring those back. On the, on the following Sunday. So those are just some things to look forward to with regard to our stewardship program. Our worship begins with confession, forgiveness, and let us stand. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who is eager to forgive and who loves us beyond our days. Dear friends, together let us acknowledge our failure to love this world as Jesus does. God of mercy and forgiveness, we confess that sin still has a hold on us. We have harmed your good creation. We have failed to do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with you. Turn us in a new direction. Show us the path that leads to life. Be our refuge and strength on the journey through Jesus Christ, our Redeemer and friend. Amen. Beloved of God, your sins are forgiven and you are made whole. God points the way to new life in Christ, who meets us on the road. Journey now in God's abiding love through the power of the Holy Spirit. We sing the hymn. The grace and peace of Jesus Christ, who was raised from the dead to bring everlasting hope, be with you all.
Let us pray. Holy God, our righteous judge, daily your mercy surprises us with everlasting forgiveness. Strengthen our hope in you and grant that all the peoples of the earth may find their glory in you. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Please be seated. First reading this morning is from Jeremiah 14. Although our iniquities testify against us, act, O Lord, for your name's sake. Our rebellions needed are many, and we have sinned against you. O Israel, O hope of Israel, its Savior in time of trouble, why should you be like a stranger in the land, like a traveler turning aside for the night? Why should you be like someone com confused, like a mighty warrior who cannot help? Yet you, O oh Lord, are in the midst of us, and we are calling by, called by your name. Do not forsake us. Thus says the Lord concerning his people. Truly they have loved to wander. They have not restrained their feet. Therefore the Lord does not accept them. Now he will remember their iniquity and punish their sins. Have you completely rejected Judah? Does your heart loathe Zion? Why have you struck us down so that there is no healing for us? We look for peace, but find no good for a time of healing, but there is terror instead. We acknowledge our weakness, weaknesses, wickedness, O oh Lord, the iniquity of our ancestors, for we have sinned against you. Do not spurn us. For your name's sake, do not dishonor your glorious throne. Remember and do not break your covenant with us. Can, many, can any idols of the nations bring rain, or can the heavens give showers? Is it not you, O Lord, our God? We set our hope on you, for it is you who do all these, this. Word of God, word of life. God. The second reading is from 2 Timothy chapter 4. As for me, I am already being poured out as a libation, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. From now on, there is reserved for me the crown of righteousness, from which, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day and not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. At my first defense, no one came to my support, but all deserted me. May it not be counted against them, but the Lord stood by me and gave me strength, so that though through me the message shall be fully proclaimed and all the Gentiles might hear it. So I was rescued from the lion's mouth, the Lord will rescue me from every evil attack and save me for his heavenly kingdom. To me, the glory forever and ever. Amen. Word of God, word of life. Thanks to God. Good morning. I thought this morning, um, I thought I would build a tower. And uh, for, all the, for all the good things I've done this week, yeah, we should take credit for some of the good things we do, right? So um, I have a friend who had surgery this week, so I made her a meal, and I went and visited her. Um, got breakfast, got all the kids to school on time this week, got all the kids to practice on time. Oh, well, that's just great. I'm not very good at building towers. But the point is, Jesus wanted to teach his disciples that whenever people think they are so good that they don't need God, that they're headed for a fall. They get so high and mighty about all the good things they've done, they just crash. There were two men who went to church. One bragged about all the good things he did, and one went to church to 
ask forgiveness for his sins because he knew he could never do enough to live up to what God had expected of him, all the good things and be as good as God. You see, the second man knew he could never do enough of the good things on his own and that he needed God. But the first man, Jesus wasn't impressed with him. He was bragging, and he was trying to compare his goodness to the goodness of God. And it just didn't stack up. I invite you to join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for catching us when we fall. Remind us that we need you. Amen. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the 18th chapter. Glory to you, o Lord. Jesus also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and regarded others with contempt. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, was praying thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, thieves, rogues, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of all my income. But the tax collector standing far off would not even look up to heaven, but was beating his breast and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his home justified rather than the other. For all who exalt themselves will be humbled, but all who humble themselves will be exalted. This is the gospel of our Lord. Let us pray. Lord, teach us and lead us to be humble. We pray this in your name. Amen. One afternoon, a carpet layer had just finished installing carpet for a customer. Somebody in the back row there might have to connect with this, this story here. <laughs> He stepped out for a smoke, only to realize that he had lost his cigarettes. After a quick but fruitless search, he noticed that in the middle of the room, under the carpet that he had just installed, was a bump. Aha, his cigarettes. No sense pulling up the entire floor for one pack of smokes, the carpet layer said to himself. So he got out of his mallet and flattened the lump. Not long after, as he was cleaning up, the homeowner came in. Here, she said, handing him his pack of cigarettes. <clears throat> I found them in the hallway. Now, she said, I'm wondering if you have seen my hamster. He escaped from his cage. He likes to crawl under things. Oops, my bad. Sometimes we know we've made a mistake. Sometimes we don't. It's the ones we don't see that can really bite us. The website Mental Floss has a list of the 20 greatest mistakes in history. They include the mistake that burned down London. On the night of September 1st, 1666, the oven of the royal baker to the King of England sparked a fire. It wasn't a sp spectacular fire, and it seemed like no big deal at first, but the fire burned for five days in the end it wiped out 13,000 homes and leveled 80% of the city. The mistake that sobered up America. Prohibition in the United States lasted from 1920 to 1933, and during this period it was illegal to manufacture, transport, and sell alcoholic beverages. It seemed like a great idea at the time. Outlaw liquor and you eliminate a whole range of alcohol-related social ills. But of course, Americans like to have a drink or two, and 
prohibition opened our eyes to the ways in which organized crime was able to meet this demand in profitable and violent and destructive ways. The mistake that killed John Wayne. Much of the filming for the movie The Conqueror was done in Utah's Snow Canyon, which is located about 150 miles downwind from a nuclear testing facility. At least 91 of the 220 people who work on the movie contracted cancer, and more than half of them died, including John Wayne. A spark jumps out of an oven. A baker fails to snuff it. A well-intentioned ban is placed on alcohol. A movie is filmed downwind from a nuclear facility. These are small oversights, errors, and miscalculations that we do not tend to see as major mistakes, at least at the time. But the secret problems can hurt us. They can quickly get out of control and kill us. They should drive us to our knees, cause us to do some searching self-examination, and lead us to confess what the Bible calls hidden faults. You can look that up, Psalm 19, verse 12. In other words, they should cause us to admit to God, my bad, my bad. In our gospel reading for today, Jesus tells the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector, addressing it to people who feel self-righteous and regard others with contempt. In other words, he is speaking to us, average people who tend to see ourselves as better than average. Now, studies show that nine in 10 managers rate themselves as superior to their average colleagues as do nine in 10 college professors. And pastors really are no different. I mean, we all think that we're the greatest preacher. You know, what, what, what's one thing that you do well? And we'll all say, well, preaching. And apparently the same is true with regard to Americans who have a driver's license. The one thing that unites all human beings, regardless of age, gender, religion, economic status, or ethnic background, says humorist Dave Barry, is that deep down inside, we all believe that we are above average drivers. Jesus says that two men go up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and one a tax collector. The natural assumption made by anyone hearing this story is that the Pharisee is a devout person, the good driver. The tax collector, on the other hand, is the sinner, the bad driver. Well, sure enough, the Pharisee steps away from the crowd in order to maintain his purity before God and launches into this list of all of his religious accomplishments. God, I thank you that I am not like other people, thieves, rogues, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of all my income. Of course, he does everything right, according to the standards of the day, obeying all the religious rules of the road. In in terms of keeping God's commandments, he is way above average. But then the tax collector bows his head beats his breast and says, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. He's feeling so ashamed that he cannot even raise his hands and look up to heaven, which was the standard position for first century prayer. The tax collector doesn't make any boasts or excuses. He simply asks for God's mercy. There's no reason to assume that this tax collector is a particularly spectacular sinner. If he were a thief, a rogue, or an adulterer, Jesus would probably have said so. It's much more likely that he is confessing a set of secret hidden faults, a collection of oversights, errors, and miscalculations that only he would know. So the above average Pharisee boasts while the sin-sick tax collector says, my bad. 
They both can make a connection with God, right? Well, no. In a surprising twist, Jesus concludes the parable by saying, I tell you, this tax collector went down to his home justified rather than the other. For all who exalt themselves will be humbled, but all who humble themselves will be exalted. The tax collector restores his relationship with God by asking for forgiveness, while the Pharisee moves farther away from God by boasting of his righteousness. Now, this isn't what the hearers of the parable probably expect. They've been taught that good behavior brings you closer to God, while bad behavior drives you away. But Jesus is insisting that unless we are aware of our secret faults and humble enough to know that we need forgiveness, we're going to discover that our minor mistakes can get out of control and destroy us. It's always better to say, my bad, than to boast, my good. Think again of the historical mistakes that seem so small at first, but then caused enormous problems. Prohibition may have been a noble idea, and a spark from a baker's oven may have seemed like no big deal, but both turned out to be huge problems. In the same way, the Pharisees' fasting and tithing seemed noble at first, and his pride and his good behavior seemed to be a minor mistake, but together these factors created a disaster. Without humility, there was no way for him to be right with God. The bottom line is this. When you trust God, you get God. But when you trust only yourself, you get only yourself. So what are the mistakes we make? Sometimes without knowing it. Perhaps it's time for us to do some searching, some self-examination. Time to confess our hidden faults and say to God, my bad. Now, one mistake that can really bite us is our failure to see the image of God in people around us. As we look around us, we tend to see differences. Different skin colors, hairstyles, tattoos, piercings, body shapes, makeup choices. Some of these differences might repel us and prompt us to step back, just like the Pharisee moved away from the crowd, not wanting to associate with unclean people. But of course, these differences are all superficial, and most don't reflect the true nature of a person. The really deep truth about the people that we see on the street or in the store is that they are children of God, created in the image and likeness of God. That is what we ought to be looking at. Another mistake is to judge others more harshly than we judge ourselves. Think of the times you have felt your temperature rising or your blood pressure rising as the line at the post office or the grocery store checkout moves at just a a, a glacial pace. And, And then when you get to the counter, the clerk messes up your transaction, and you, you want to give, give him or her a piece of your mind and say, pay attention and get it right. We're quick to judge others, but slow to judge ourselves. In our own daily work, we go easy on ourselves because we know how hard it is to focus when we are ill or tired or distracted by a personal problem. Like the Pharisee in the parable, we see sin in thieves, rogues, and adulterers, but not in ourselves. And this leads others to see us as judgmental and hypocritical, which is not always far from the truth. And finally, we err when we are not honest with God or honest with ourselves about our need for forgiveness. The tax collector saw himself clearly, and he confessed his sinfulness, saying, 
God be merciful to me, a sinner? And all of this begs the question, how do I get to a place where I see the image of God in others? Show mercy instead of judgment and recognize my own need for forgiveness. Perhaps you have a ready answer for that question, but you could suggest on the basis of this text that the answer lies in this simple prayer. That is, we should pray it regularly. How can we fail to see God in others around you when we started our day by praying, God, please show your mercy and grace to me today because I realize that I am needy and must rely on your help. Pray that prayer every morning, and you'll be less critical of others. You'll look at yourself more honestly and at others with more compassion. And let's face it, this is a prayer that each of us can say because each of us has an ongoing relationship with at least one, if not more, of the seven deadly sins. Lust, gluttony, greed, sloth, wrath, envy, and pride. Each of us needs to be forgiven, whether we acknowledge it or not. Just as the Pharisee needed to be cleansed of the sin of pride when he said, God, I thank you, I am not like other people. Time to get honest, honest with God, honest with ourselves. We cannot go home justified, restored to a right relationship with God and one another unless we admit that we need to be forgiven. That's a primary reason that we begin almost all of our worship services with a prayer of confession of sin. The opportunity comes to us here, just as it came to the Pharisee and the tax collector in the temple. The opportunity to see our mistakes, confess our hidden faults, and ask for the gift of forgiveness. And it all begins with two words, honestly spoken, my bad. Amen. We sing together.
Let us join together as we confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. In gratitude and humility. Let us join together in prayer on behalf of all God's creation. God of mercy, you are in the midst of us, and we are called by your name. Inspire your church to serve and love all people with the unceasing grace you extend to all. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. God of all creation, you formed a world where even the sparrow finds a home. Preserve the beauty and diversity of all creatures with whom we share this earth. Lead us to protect all living things. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. God of peace, you are an ever-present help in times of trouble. Rescue families and nations torn apart by violence and warfare. We especially continue to remember the people of the Ukraine. Unite all people toward common goals of reconciliation and peace for every person. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. God of hope, you stand with the suffering and give strength. Comfort your people filled with fear or anger, anxiety or shame. Bring healing to all who are sick in body, mind, or spirit. Today we especially remember Richard, Lisa, Nancy, Jan, as well as those that we name in our hearts. <laughs> Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. God of restoration, you call us to trust in you and not ourselves alone. Make this congregation a community of humility and repentance, ready to encounter you in love and follow in your ways. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. God of eternal life, to you be the glory forever. We give you thanks for all who have, who have fought the good fight, finished the race, kept the faith, and now live with you. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. With grateful hearts, we commend our spoken and silent prayers to you, O oh God, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Please share a sign of God's peace with one another. You may be seated. We will now receive the offering. Would you please take this opportunity to make sure you filled out that yellow welcome card and place it in the offering plate as it goes by.
Let us pray. Gracious God, in your great love, you richly provide for our needs. Make of these gifts a banquet of blessing and make us ready to share with all in need through Jesus Christ, who sets a table for all. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Be holy, holy. Holy, mighty, and merciful Lord, heaven and earth are full of your glory. In great love you send to us Jesus, your Son, who reached out to heal the sick and suffering, who preached good news to the poor, and who on the cross opened his arms to all. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, and when he given thanks, he gave for all to drink, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people, for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering, therefore, his death, resurrection, and ascension, we await his coming in glory. Pour out upon us the spirit of your love, O Lord, and unite the wills of all who share this heavenly food, the body and blood of Jesus Christ, our Lord to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be all honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. <clears throat> And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Christ invites you to this table. Come, taste, and see. You may be seated. If there are those of you who are receiving the elements, the prepared elements in the pew, I would invite you to make uh, those elements ready at this time. And when you have done so, take and eat the body of Christ and take and drink the blood of Christ. Mm-hmm. Of God, you to take away the sin of the world and mercy. Body of Christ given for you. Body of Christ given for you. Body of Christ given for you. Blood of Christ shed for you.
And now may the body of our Lord Jesus Christ and his holy and precious blood strengthen and keep you in his grace. Amen. Let us pray. God of the abundant table, you have refreshed our hearts in this meal with bread for the journey. Give us your grace on the road that we might serve our neighbors with joy. For the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. God, who gives life to all things and frees us from despair, bless you with truth and peace. And may the Holy Trinity, one God, guide you always in faith, hope, and love. <clears throat> Amen. We sing the hymn. in peace with Christ beside you. Thanks be to God.